Hey boys and girls, Doug Giles here. It's Warriors Rich and Wild Man. What's happening, Doug? Look at that beautiful book cover. Love it. John the Baptist, a rude awakening, precedes a great awakening, Rich. Dang it. Let's talk about Juan, as they call him down there in Yuma. <laughs> So grill me, man. You got to have some kind of questions about uh, this spicy tome of mine that has been out for 10 days and it's already tearing up Amazon and stuff. Listen, the audio version of the book, it's some funny crap. Well, it's, uh, I like that, Doug, because one of the things I like about you is you're so articulate. I am articulate. <laughs> that was a carryover joke if you didn't hear the last podcast. So we're the one. Yeah, whatever, whatever. I'm winsome and articulate. And articulate. How to win friends and influence people by mm -hmm. Dougie Giles. All right, man. Grill me. Come on. Yeah, so um, John the Baptist is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And so I'm, like I said, I was really, I'm, I am really, really looking forward to reading the book. So number one question. In studying the life of John the Baptist, what's the number one thing that you learned that caught you off guard or shocked you? Yeah, again, I've been deep diving John, uh, and he's been, you know, the the subject of a lot of my oil paintings. So, you know, kind of kind of weird obsession with with John. So, I don't know if there's anything that uh, that really struck me as new as I, you know, started to form the book John the Baptist: A Rude Awakening. Uh, precedes a great awakening. I think, you know, one of the things that just that really and I don't even I don't even know how anybody nowadays rich could even do it. Anybody who's like, yeah, I feel Jesus is calling me to the ministry. And uh, would you do 30 years in the wilderness in the University of Earth, Wind and Fire? Uh, you know, he's he's not branding himself. He's not. And I guarantee, man, that that he felt the zeal. He felt the go. He felt the, you know, he he probably, you know, saw and heard what the Pharisees are doing. He saw, you know, the Roman rule and how, you know, oppressive uh, uh, the various Caesars were to the people of God. He saw the bastardization of the temple. He saw all that, man. And here he is, hold, you know, it's kind of like in Braveheart, hold, and he's yeah. holding this stuff. And young people aren't known for patience. Young people aren't known for long for long suffering. You know, right. it's just get out there, baby, you know, and, you know, carpe diem and, you know, make it happen and YOLO. And here as a 30 year old dude, man, he waits and he waits and he waits until the fullness of time. And then poof, he goes out and he spends 30 years for a ministry that what lasted four, maybe, yep. you know, four and a half. Who does yeah. that anymore, man? Who does and that? And that's what the Bible says, you know, until the day of his manifestation, till the day of his showing or the revealing and too many people like you said they they want to it's like i'm gifted boom here i am but john was growing those roots deep because look man the ministry that that guy did was no joke like that that took balls it took balls and it took conviction um and it took obviously grace and the power of the holy spirit but but what an incredible life you can't live that life on man i think i love jesus like that guy stood up to people and they respected him right until the day of his showing or the day of his manifestation. There, there he was, John the Baptist. And you know they estimated, Doug, that over 750,000 people walked into the desert to hear him preach. They made that journey to go hear Dude, that guy preach. I would. And I think it. I think it's, uh, what, 26? How many miles is it outside of Jerusalem and stuff where he yeah, was actually? Yeah, it's far. I can't remember how many. Do you know how many? Yeah, I don't know. And uh, I it know was it far, was far, though. Uh, yeah, it was like a day's walk and stuff. And, right. Uh, I don't know, you know, how quickly you could get there on Camelback or anything like that. But uh, again, you know, when you when you think of the critter uh, that is John the Baptist, um, brother, nobody, Rich, <laughs> nobody would touch him uh, with a ten foot pew in regards to, you know, first of all, we wouldn't. Uh, we wouldn't select him to be the MC of the main event in human history. No. There's no way. No you way. Know, it's like, who who can we get to introduce Jesus? What about Kurt Cameron? Or what about Kurt and Candace Cameron, brother and sister duo? They're sharp, good-looking, you know, uh, yep. well-heeled and well-spoken 
uh, Christian uh, states people, or we could get some dude uh, rich like Mike Pence, bring a little gray-headed gravitas to the main event of human history. And uh, God, God looks for a, a guy that uh, eats weird stuff, uh, is, you know, an aesthetic, he's isolated. Uh, he's zero like anybody on this planet, especially the, you know, the, the blue blood Pharisees and Sadducees. And uh, he's got a turn or burn message. And right. God says, that's my special boy for the main event in human history. Yeah, and we would we would completely ignore some weird cat like that. Can you imagine, Rich? Right. You got covered dish dinner going down. People got the casserole. Hey, by the way, speaking of casserole, there's there's um, my wife did a, a thing that would kind of uh, introduce the various religions to the kiddos when she was teaching school uh, down in Fort Lauderdale when we lived down there, and she wanted uh, people to bring something that represents. Uh, their religion. And so Maria from, you know, parents are from Cuba. She brings a crucifix. She goes, hello, my name's Maria, and this is a crucifix. And then uh, Shlomo, who's Jewish, obviously, lots of Jews live down there in Miami. He brings a Star of David, and he goes, hello, my name's Shlomo, and this is a Star of David. And then the next kid, uh, Billy, he gets up. He said, hello, my name's Billy. I'm a Baptist, and this is a casserole. <laughs> Probably the worst joke ever. Hey, dude, uh, that's gold, man. When I was uh, when I was preparing for for Easter weekend, I I saw something, and and what you were talking about. When you think of John the Baptist, we don't have to wonder what he looked like. The Bible talks about it, it describes him, right? And uh, you know, we think, oh, he looks like how they looked back then. No, he was a little extra wild. Like he, okay. So when you looked at him, you thought prophet, and when you thought prophet, you thought old school. Even for them, it's like, well, this dude's hair, his beard, he's eating uh, locusts, you know? I mean, the dude's wearing camel hair. I mean, he he's looked- got a, he's, got a home, he's got a homemade fur coat. That's right, redneck like he, stuff, folks. He literally looks like an old school prophet. And this is the thing that I read the other day that really blew my mind. It said John, because I had never thought of it in this context. John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Right. That, that John, I always think New Testament, he's a new, te- he's the last, bro, how good is that? He's the last Old Testament prophet. And and homie did it right. You know what I mean? He was, like you said, he was ushering in a, a completely new season of what God was doing. I, I think that's incredible. And and I think it's important. Yeah, and again, we can understand you know, John better if we understand that he is an Old Testament prophet. Right. And, and again, you know, when you see the coupling of of what God did with with John's ministry and you know with you know with Christ the the startup of his ministry and they're coupled together and it says in Malachi 4 that you know if you want the the son of righteousness to shine on you then it's preceded always by the ministry of Elijah and and that's something that that really you know when we talk about revival it's like hey we're having a revival at our school well the school just shut it down well i don't think that's <laughs> I don't it's think not that's revival. how that works. Right. It's it's a great elongated, you know, worship service, refreshing, whatever you want to call it. But when it gets down to, you know, real no crap great awakenings, obviously, you know, the greatest awakening was was Christ and his first coming. Right. And um and then you you see what accompanied that great awakening and it was a searing message of repentance. It was a rebuke to everybody and their dog, it was it was so rough on the listeners that after John, after John would finish preaching, uh, soldiers go, oh, "Man, what do we, what do we do? What do we do?" And the tax collectors are like, "What do we do?" And then the commoners are like, "What what do I need to do? Who says that anymore?" You know, it's right. like, "What's God going to do for me?" And John so branded their brain. But here's the here's the thing that I'm trying to get to awkwardly right now, Richard, is you know, we want Jesus, but we do not want John. And we don't, we don't want the aspect of you really want to brutally repent of wasting your time, not glorifying God, wasting your mind, uh, being a self-obsessed me monkey, having the word of God come like a hammer and shatter the, the rock of your heart. You want to yeah. see his acts go to the root of everything that's not producing righteous fruit in your life. 
Hell no, people don't want that. They want miracles, blessing, prosperity, beautiful girlfriend, heart of Mother Teresa, you know, everything to be, you know, turbulence free. That's what they want to occur in their life. They don't want this massive yeah. upending of well, the rocks and the stumps and all the crap that's in our hearts that keep Christ from uh, coming in. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, people, they want to attend a revival. Check this out. When it's convenient. Like, hey, I'd love to go see a revival. But how many yeah, people like want to experience a personal revival? Or who wants to be responsible to bring the revival? Not very many people are saying, hey, how do I bring a revival to my world? Uh, we have answers to that question, right? Here, here's a great thing, because you said they, they canceled the <clears throat> meetings at the school. So you know about this, but our Warriors and Wildman listeners are going to love this. So the Moravian church community um, in 1727 commence a round-the-clock prayer watch that continued nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop, not for two weeks, not for three weeks, not for 100, 100 years, years, right? Over 100 years, <laughs> right. bro. Over, a, and and look, how, how many of those times was it not, yeah, man, it was just the hard work of I'm going to cover my spot. I am going to pray. I am going to be here. And because sometimes it's just the hard work of John the Baptist. It is just the grinding and the grinding. And like you said, we see the short ministry at the end of his life. But what about all the grinding that happened before that when God was prepping him, right? Now, here's a great thing. In 1791, 65 years after the commencement of that prayer vigil. So they've been praying for 65 years, 24 hours a day. The small Moravian community had sent 300 missionaries to the ends of the earth. This is a small group of, you want to know what revival looks like? That's what it looks like. It looks like somebody who's willing to be broken, somebody who's yeah. ready to be crushed. John the Baptist laid it all down, paid the price. And because of that, he was, he was the guy. He was chosen to announce Jesus. You know, <clears throat> you know what, you know what our you know job what is to, to announce Jesus. <clears throat> That's our job. So we should follow that model. We should go through the hard difficult time in silence that everybody's not seeing, growing, putting those roots down, and then paying the price, laying the groundwork, start praying, start living that life. Guess what? We could have some anointing on our life and we can announce the coming of Jesus to this generation. Yeah. And uh, keep saying all those uh, awkward and naughty things that, that John said while he was preaching, which pastors now, you know, they, they flee from that kind of stuff. Like Trump flees from a Nancy Pelosi lingerie party. John said, uh, the wrath of God is against you. He, he didn't say God has a wonderful plan for your life. He said, judgment is coming. Uh, he, he, not, he not only said that, but uh, he pointed out particular sins of the pharisees and uh herod and again nobody does that called them out and and god's like you know what this is what we need he's exactly what the doctor ordered and i was talking to this uh brother the other day he doesn't live uh um where i live but we communicate over this thing called a telephone are you familiar with the telephone i have familiar it's it's quite the device and um anyway he was saying how uh how the church that he's a part of, they come up with sermons that completely freaking dance around all the things that John the Baptist and Jesus, by the way, right. preach. Repentance, don't talk about it. Wrath of God, out. Fear of God, out. And and I saw the commercial from their pastor, Rich. Oh my God. It he was like, first of all, he's holding his hands like this, he's steepling. And Dr. Sproul said, never oh. steeple. What that means is that you're an arrogant jackass, and you think that you know more than anybody in the room. Anyhow, so he's steepling, Rich, and he's like, I want, I want to tell you uh, something. If you come to my church, we will have very entertaining music. We also promise to have a very uplifting service, and we want to, you to know that it'll be fun for the whole family at our church oh so please come bring your friends and family amusement park. and i was like like oh my god i just i just watched a false prophet speak for 
30 seconds. Right. Can you imagine John the Baptist like, hey, y'all come on out to the Muddy Creek here in Jordan. He said, we're, <laughs> we're going to have lemonade, going to have some cotton candy, going to have some uh, helicopter dropping Easter eggs on the kiddos. And also it's going to be very entertaining. All the family's going to love it. I guarantee you'll be encouraged. Y'all come on out. Bro, li- listen to this. So, and this is all going to be connected, believe it or not. So in our city, there's a, there's a billboard, church in our city, and I know the pastors. I love these guys. They're great people. But their billboard says, God is on your side. And I thought, every time I drive by it, I think, no, he's not. God doesn't get on sides. He is the right. side, Right. And so I was, I'm watching this series. I try to watch stuff like this once a year or so, but I'm watching a series on Netflix called, uh, dope. And it's about, um, the drug trade and trafficking in Colombia and into Spain and the U S and all the different stuff. And it's the real guys, man. It's, and I, I don't like watching it, but it's talking about the problem with fentanyl and heroin and all that. Okay. And it's got the actual traffickers, the Sicarios, their faces are covered, you know, bro, almost every single one of them mentions God. I'm not joking. They say, Mm. yeah, I'm going to try to get through the border. You know, God willing, I'm going to make it. They literally say, I pray, you know, I don't believe in religion, but I believe in God. And I pray that God would, yeah, you know, God willing, I'm just doing this for my family. And, you know, I got to get out here on the streets and, and, you know, if, if God will help me, you know, I'll be able to sell all of this, this crack. I'm not exaggerating. Like if you watch it, you'll freak out. But that's, that's the kind of thinking that comes from a statement. God's on your side. No, God is not on your side. He's on his side. So that takes it to a Bible story. I'll I'll wrap it up with this and and get your thoughts on it. Joshua is going to Jericho as he was commanded by the Lord. He didn't make that up. God told him, this is what you're going to do. On the way there, he sees the angel of the Lord. You know, scholars say a pre-incarnate Christ. And he says, hey, are you for us or against us? (laughs) This is a bro. For you or against you, I'm I'm the the ho- the captain of the host. I'm I'm on my side, Jack. And what does Joshua do? He's like, uh oh, the Lord showed up. Throws everything down, lays on his face on the ground. He's like, okay, time out. I'm on your side. I'm doing what you said. You showed up. I'm making sure you know I'm on your side. God is not on your side. He doesn't get on your side. He doesn't help you make drug deals. He doesn't help you bang your your, uh, adulterous girlfriend. He doesn't help you steal money. He doesn't help you rip people off. He doesn't help you in all these things. And then we say God's on your side and he's not helping the people on the dope movie and he's not helping you. That's stupid, man. Yeah, I find it uh, real interesting, man, how, and you know, again, Rich, I could regale you or depress you or both uh telling you just how uh freaking bad i've been how corrupt and shameful you know uh stuff is still in my heart and i think you know and so i'm i'm not you know pearl clutching over here oh my god i can't believe people do such evil evil stuff i'm no choir boy okay i had a very jacked up background and it haunts me till today, but Christ is victorious uh, yeah. in me and through me. Yes. So with all that said, I, I see people, man, that are, that are frickin' uh, uh, just bumping uglies, fornicating. They're, they're not married. They're, you know, and it's, they're living together. And it's like Jesus and God. And it's like, man, you are frickin' loopy. If you think that that's <laughs> that that you can practice, it's one thing to you know. It's like, oh man, I, I screwed up. Me and my girlfriend slept with each other. We repent. We put ourselves under accountability. We want to do it, you know, right. Going into the nuptials, you know what I mean? It's one thing to just just completely flout it. It's like, hey, I know it's there, but screw it, you know. Right. And then think and then think that you know God is still uh, blessing you and over you if, on your if side. You th- yeah, if you think that, man, you're under this thing called a delusion, and God is allowing deceptive spirits to come in and uh, deceive you. And if you maintain that pace and that glide path, it's not going to end pretty. And right. uh, your your fairy tale relationship is going to go up in smoke, man. 
and, and these pastors are going to be held accountable for not telling the truth and, right. and letting people know that they can be saved. They're like, yeah, well, we are. no, you're not letting them know. You're not letting them. You're, you're not telling them the gospel. Right. And so they're under the delusion. Hey, look what God has done. You know, we've got this this man or this woman. And uh, it's like, hey, you're not married and it's not sanctioned. Uh, it's not, you know, covenantal before God. So it's it's immoral and it's fornication. And that's what I that, again, that's what I dig rich broken record coming up about expository preaching, because it pushes you to deal with those particular sins instead of jumping and hopping and skipping over them, Rich, because they won't fly with the self-obsessed me monkey Christian that occupies our big screen TV smoke machine churches, you know, and it's yep. just unpopular. And I wondered sometimes, you know, it's like, huh, Rich, I wonder, I why, 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 why wonder why some people have left our church. Uh, they got confronted, yeah, by the word, and I think I think the demons inside people. And I'm not saying everybody who left got a, got a demon in them. Or yeah, maybe like some that. of them just don't like you. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think I think the powers of darkness. Like if they found like some place person to inhabit, and there's you know this this uh, it's not just a fleshly you know problem anymore. Now you got demons on top of that giving in to fleshly appetites. I think they know, man, that if you go and sit here, uh, we're going to be evicted from our trailer house and we can't live here anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, and it could be something that's, uh, you know, subconscious or very conscious that, you know, I can't, I cannot do what I'm doing now and listen to that word. Yep. And you know what? I, when we talk about expository preaching, I, I a couple of thoughts I have on that. One is, uh, Jesus didn't do that. But another thought is that we have two extremes going on. Um, one is we have the people who are so spiritual that the Holy Spirit speaks to them 30 minutes before they preach, and then they just preach on whatever topic or whatever positive thing or whatever they feel like doing. And then you have the people that are so structured and rigid that they couldn't bring a timely word from God if their life depended on it. And so I, I, one of my things that I try to teach pastors when I'm helping pastors is pastors need to be systematic and prophetic. And, and I'll define that systematic in that you are teaching through a system of teachings because the Baptists are good at that. They'll take you from here to here. Good thing. Awesome. But you want to be systematic in that you're going through a system of teachings. And then you want to be prophetic where you're interjecting timely words from God for the congregation of the people that you're discipling and putting those things together. And sometimes we get way over here and we get way over here, you know, and uh, I think those things need to work together. And, and that that's practical for me. That's practical uh, instruction for pastors and teachers. It's not a doctrine that I'm building on that. The Bible doesn't say that either. But um, I, I think people don't want to hear the word of God and they don't want to hear all of the word of God. And yeah. if you really want to be discipled and you want to know Christ, then you need to read the Bible for yourself. I, we just started with our young people reading uh, My Utmost for His Highest. We told them, we want you to read that every day. What I, we teach people to do devotionals, but what I want you to do is get outside of your emotions and what you're looking for and what you're personally going through. And I want you to read something that's the most famous devotional that's ever been written, <clears throat> or at least surely the most popular. And the reason it's popular is because they have one for every day. It takes five minutes to read it. And when you read it, man, some of those things are so simple. And it's like, bam, got you. See you tomorrow. And uh, we need to get outside of our normal deal because it's like purebred dogs. They have the most health problems than any other dog on the planet because they're interbred over and over and over. And then you see a mutt. You know what it costs to take care of a mutt? Zero because they have the best genes in the world. We never want to get right. so isolated that we're just turning that stuff over and over and over. What we want to do is get really good input you know, like that. And so, yeah. And well, that's why I, I, we need John the Baptist today because he's not around. Where's John the Baptist? Right. We need him in the pulpit. Yeah, and, and that's what, uh, that's what I dig about. I mean, he's, he's so obtuse. He was nothing like, uh, the inbred Pharisees. If you want to see a documentary on, uh, on inbredness, if that's a word, if not, uh, I will, I will put it into <laughs> just our, uh, just be articulate Wikipedia. Yeah. I'll put it into Wikipedia as soon as the podcast's over. Uh, on YouTube, it's the soft white underbelly, and it's this uh, it's this inbred family from West Virginia, 
And man, these guys are, woo, they go back, you know, many generations and layers and layers of brothers doing sisters. And I mean, it's, and the, and then, you know, then they've got, you know, in real time, these, these critters that are living in West Virginia and they, they talk with like clicking and barking. And it's, it'll blow your mind, Rich. And I was thinking, you know what? I don't, I don't even know Christians. if I want to watch it. Oh, it's, it's, you got to watch it. So there's, there's one that's like 10 minutes long. The other one's uh, uh, 22 minutes, a soft white underbelly on YouTube. And um, so it's a documentary on, on these, uh, on this uh, interesting family. And, um, but Christians can get like that. You know, the Pharisees in breads, like, Hey, we should mm. wash our hands before we eat. Oh, but we should really, really wash them. And we should wash our copper pots also. Oh, and we should wash all of our utensils. And so you get this. And then wash our hands re- after we yeah. wash the pots. <laughs> and then you get all this stupid inbred religious things. And then God sends this freaking Lenny Kravitz uncouth. A uh, hippie that's not playing by their rules to introduce uh, the rebellious son of God. Who, uh, by the way, for those who think, well, Jesus was so much nicer than John the Baptist. Huh. Uh, no, he wasn't. And when when Jesus wanted to know what the scuttlebutt on the street was about who do people say that he is, and they said, well, he acts like John the Baptist and Elijah and Jeremiah and one of the prophets. The point being. For those who think Jesus was meek and mild and sweet and gentle, uh, the disciples labeled him just like Elijah. He's no pussy. Jeremiah, he was no, you know, frail little snowflake. John the Baptist, he was rougher than grandmother's breath. And everybody said uh, Christ was one of those guys resurrected. Yeah. And you don't get that kind of, Rich, you don't get that kind of moniker uh, by, you know, being you know genteel and like you know some i don't know garrison keeler raconteur i mean that he yeah. was popping off just like john just like elijah and just like jeremiah i think that's and, and i'm tired kind of interesting even the modern movies they're making about jesus and shows and series and stuff why does he have to talk like and then blah blah it's the same. It's the same stuff with art, man. They they want because that is art. So that's film. It's art. So they want life. They want us poor little puppets in the flower state to uh, take on that kind of emasculated, soft focus, you know, feminine hygiene, bearded lady version of Christ. Yeah. Because if we if we get like that, Rich, uh, we become this thing called brainwashed and controllable, and they Weak. gaslit us. Yep into this uh, uh, Namby Pamby Nabob Jesus uh, BS. So that's- yeah, it drives me insane, it's bro. It's personal. Yeah. It's like you said, they never show John going, hey guys, maybe looking into their eyes. Yeah. Jesus didn't have to act spiritual. He is the expression of spirituality. When you have to change your voice and wrinkle your forehead, you're not spiritual to me. You're an actor. I was praying with a group of people one time in another country. And it was right before service and they were praying and in their language, they were going, Oh, and, and in English, cause I don't want to say which country, but they were praying. They were going, Oh Lord. Oh, 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 oh Lord. Oh Lord. And we said, amen. And then somebody goes, Oh, we forgot to pray for this. They're like, Oh, okay. Oh, 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 oh. And they went right back. I'm like, that's an act. It's a play. What the heck are you right. doing? I pray. Like I talk, I preach. Like I talk, I yep. talk to people, how I talk. Now, sometimes I talk, more calm with a more sensitive voice because of the topic, but I don't go around going, oh, trying to make you think it's spiritual. I'm done <laughs> with this crap. Yeah. It's so fake. I can't handle the fakery. Does you hear how I articulated that word, fakery? Well, again, that's uh, that's why John and Jesus are very appealing, and the little tinker pot pastors with their little preachy voice and stuff, they're appalling. <laughs> and uh, I think there's going to come a rich... Uh, a renaissance, a revival, uh, a reformation of the yeah. Church of the New Groove where real, raw, and relevant John the Baptist-like guys and girls are going to come to the forefront. Uh, these prior uh, or present you know, gatekeepers who are scared of preaching the Word of God, uh, scared of uh, uh, rebuking politicians like John and Jesus did, scared of rebuking who's who of the current compromised glitterati of Christian influencers. I think we're going to see the table switch and a lot of people who felt ignored or in the wilderness for years 
are finally going to get called online and they're going to get a ministry, you know, like uh, like Mike we're talking about. That's yep. funny as hell, man. I mean, what God's doing with him, that's hilarious. I love and that's it. Exactly, that's exactly, you know, why I wrote uh, the book, John the Baptist. Listen to my uh, dedication page. <coughs> I'm going to read right here, Rich. Where is it? It's at the front of the book, right, Rich? I think it Usually? is. Okay, here it is. Dedication. This quick read is for all my prophetic brothers and sisters out there in evangelical La La Land. You are needed now more than ever. So pick up your whip and start clearing the punks. Let's go. I love it. I love it. All right, buddy. So aside from uh, people buying, and listen, this is great for uh, group study, uh, yep. dudes, girls, I don't care, young people. Uh, it's 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 easy to read. It's 154 pages. You can you can blow to it uh, real quick. But the principles, Rich. Uh, oh my God, they're gonna rub them raw. It's yes. It's gonna upset everything that needs to be upset. It'll shake everything that needs to be shaken. And um, uh, buy five copies uh, for your rowdy friends. They'll dig it. And uh, great graduation present too. Yeah. So aside from doing that, buying that, and uh, blowing that thing out and studying this uh, this wild iconoclastic critter named John the Baptist who God has uh, eternally spot-welded with his son, what else does a warrior and wild man need to do? Go to warriorsandwildmen.com, subscribe, it's free. We'll hit you up with a couple emails a week, let you know what's happening, keep you connected. And for those that want to help support the ministry, hit the war chest, tax deductible. When you give your gift, we'll send you that information. For those that are doing it, you guys rock. Warriors and Wild Men, out. Mm-hmm.